out. Here we go. So uh, hopefully you all know that this is the introductory workshop for or top first labor league. It's all about uh, things that we think coaches would need to know um, to be successful. We won't cover absolutely everything under the sun because we have other workshops that go into more detail. Um, and I expect you know that uh, it's a three hour workshop, but we'll do one hour tonight, one hour tomorrow night and one hour Wednesday night. Uh, there are four instructors uh, collaborating this season, Terry, Don, uh, Jim, and myself. And so if you need to reach us, here's some contact information. I think you all have, no, you, you may not have my email. So if you know how to spell my Schaefer, S-C-H-A-F-E-R, then you can add ortop.org to that, Bruce-Schaefer at ortop.org. And I'm pretty responsive to email. So if you don't get a response in a few hours, send it again because uh, something went wrong or, or send me a text message uh, or call me at this number here, 332-4666. The program director for uh, ORTOP, uh, which delivers first programs here in Oregon is Debbie Kerr. Imagine that most of you have received an email from Debbie, but you see the pattern holds there. You know how to spell her Debbie and, and her version of Kerr. I put a hyphen in there and you can get her by email. So the general goals is to provide an understanding of a little bit of all the programs, but mostly about First Leg of League Challenge. Uh, talk a little bit about the value of the program, uh, to the children. Um, oh, uh, Sally's asking if I'll send the slides. Let me make a note of that. Yeah, so if something's on a slide, uh, assume you'll get a PDF of that. If uh, I say something you don't see on a slide, you might want to write that down somewhere if you, if you think you might want to refer to it later. Um, so we want to uh, talk about why, why people do it. Uh, the kids enjoy it. The kids learn a lot from it. Um, one reason why it's a successful program is it's also fun for the adults in a variety of ways, partly personal fun and partly uh, fun of seeing what the kids accomplish and how they enjoy it. And we'll talk about opportunities to get involved, uh, assuming until you tell me otherwise that you're either planning on being a coach or at least considering being one. But uh, that might vary. Some, somebody might be here uh, for more general curiosity purposes. So we're gonna cover lots of things over three sessions, but this is kind of a top level view of what we'll cover. We'll do introductions in a minute and we'll cover some of the things uh, on this list tonight and then we'll continue and I'll, at the end of today's session I'll give you a foreshadow of what we'll be covering tomorrow. So when I created this version of the slides uh, a year ago, uh, Zoom was new to a lot of people, uh, probably less so this year than the last. Um, um, but in the lower left-hand corner, you can uh, control whether you're muted or not. It's a little microphone icon. You can turn your camera off and on uh, in the camera icon next to it. And about the middle of the bottom of the screen, there's chat. Uh, and you can uh, send a chat to me by selecting my name, or you can send it to everyone or to somebody else you recognize here. Um, and um, there are ways of choosing what you see. Um, I right now got it set to gallery view so I can see on one side of my screen, a bunch of people. Um, but you can also set it to speaker view. And when I hold up something up to show you, you might wanna go to the upper right-hand corner and select speaker view to 
make me bigger so that you can see what I'm holding up and then you can make me small again by clicking on gallery view or one of the other views. Any questions about Zoom features? So, um, because we got some material uh, to cover, I, I think I, I won't put you all on the spot to uh, talk about your background. Uh, instead, I'll ask you to put some things in chat. Um, your, your name will probably automatically appear unless you've logged in under uh, somebody else in your same household, which occasionally happens. Um, and uh, you might mention what your role is, uh, teacher, coach, parent, um, somebody has got background noise. Oh, somebody uh, muted. Good. Um, you can mention any previous Lego or uh, robotics coaching. Uh, and I'm personally curious as to whether you've decided on which kit you're going to use. Um, EB3 has been around for years and is a great kit. Um, Spike Prime uh, was introduced by Lego about a year and a half ago. And about a year ago, they announced that they were going to stop selling the EB3 kit. But some of you may have access to them um, for historic reasons. And I won't be surprised if some of you are undecided on uh, which kit because you're attending tonight to learn about these things. And uh, perhaps we can give you some ideas on the differences of the kits um, and et cetera. So I see uh, Chris is uh, a coach. Uh, got, uh, oh, I think uh, Chris is probably referring to First Lego League Junior, which is now called First Lego League Explorer, the first year uh, that he's coached the challenge program, which is more ro robotics than the Explorer is, although Explorer is getting more robotics every year. But it's for the younger kids. We'll get into that. Um, I'm seeing Kendra as a uh, physical education and tag teacher, no experience with Lego robotics. Um, and she thinks she may have a kid older than both of those. The one prior to that was called NXT. Uh, that's still legal. Uh, I, I'm pretty rusty on NXT, uh, but um, yeah, buying a new kit may, may be a good idea. Um, Terry is a fifth grade dual language teacher, uh, first year coaching from NISA, no Lego experience. No idea about kit, so we'll get into that. Uh, Chris says he just got Spike Prime, built the table last week. <coughs> First meeting um, with the kids, I assume, is um, tomorrow night. Uh, Hunter says, been a coach and actively involved with First Lego League for the past couple of years, supporting hopefully six coaches. Oh, wow, that's leverage, and um, good for you. Want to make sure you have the, all the information. Um, Majid says, first time coach, FLL challenge, uh, has an EB3 kit. And uh, Susla in, uh, no, Patrick is in Susla, which is near Florence, Oregon, computer science teacher, uh, first year coach for First Lego League, and uh, has access to EB3 kits, but now has access to Spike Prime. Jeremy says, coach parent, past assistant coach, planning on using Spike Prime, uh, first year to use it. Um, Melody is with the uh, Malheur Educational Service District and as a STEM specialist, STEM hub person, uh, eight years teaching, three years first Lego League, supports a bunch of coaches in Malheur County. Laura, second grade teacher, coaches with others in, in third to fifth grade. And uh, Melody goes on to say she has uh, EB3 kits uh, 
that can be reserved. Um, so did I miss anybody uh, from the chat? Uh, one new message, Sally says first year coach, um, looking at using EB3. Very good, that's helpful to me. Uh, so we will talk about both kits tonight, uh, not in a whole bunch of detail, but uh, lightly and, we, and then uh, sessions coming up tomorrow and the next day, we'll get more into some of those details. Um, right now, I, I do have um, the uh, chat on the screen, so I'll probably see if you send me a, a question by chat, but if I don't, uh, it's because it got covered up by something on my small screen. So feel free to turn off your mic and shout out your question. It makes more more interesting for me to interact in a variety of ways. So what problem are we trying to solve with uh, offering First Lego League Challenge? Uh, it has to do with uh, our society is changing. Uh, we need a lot of engineers, technicians, technologists to get overly uh, into economics. Um, uh, the whole world is getting more technical, um, but for the US and Oregon to compete in, on the world stage, we need to be particularly technical because we sure can't be a leader in low cost manufacturing. Um, those kinds of things tend to be more and more done offshore. We need to be doing things that are high uh, value add that might be high value, uh, high tech, maybe robotics control manufacturing, uh, can be the service industry, whether that be legal accounting, uh, uh, computer science education, uh, et cetera. So where are these people gonna come from? Um, we are starting to see some growth in that area, but there are concerns that uh, a lot of kids assume that uh, science, technology, engineering, math is only for the smartest kid in the class. And what they don't understand is this stuff is accomplished in teams. And no one, it, it, this is not uh, an era of da Vinci uh, knowing everything in, uh, in one person. It's an era of teamwork um, where things get accomplished by a variety of, of ex expertise. And in fact, First Lego League features that uh, a successful team is all about uh, collaboration, cooperation, and there so much so there's even a special trademark word called coopetition um, that combines the word of competing and collaborating uh, and cooperating. Uh, I have a kind of a vision that um, when some of these kids go into college or to professions, uh, and are, have a reason to work on a group project. Um, the one that's got some confidence in, in, on the new team, whether it be college freshmen, college seniors, or in the workplace, is somebody that did it at age nine in first Lego League Challenge and did it again, hopefully in 10th and uh, later grades through the same program or first tech challenge or first robotics competition, learning uh, not only technology, but soft skills. Uh, the things um, that don't always get taught in school. Uh, schools um, historically been based on uh, individual grades. Uh, succeeding in first Lego League challenges about uh, collaborating as a team and succeeding together. Uh, when I got started, there were two programs. Uh, I've been doing it for about 20 years. Uh, you can tell from my gray hair. That's, uh, I, I wasn't quite as gray 20 years ago as I am now. Um, the um, programs that existed at the time were first revised competition, which is for the older kids in high school. And you see that at the bottom of this list. Um, and uh, I was not involved here in Oregon with that, except peripherally, I volunteered to be a judge one time, um, but that changed in, in 2016. Touch on that. I did get involved uh, it, based on my interest in, in Lego robotics. I was actually teaching for Saturday Academy here in Portland um, as a volunteer. And I contacted first and said, what is this thing called First Lego League? And they said, well, we'd be happy to tell you, but um, do, do you know the people at OMSI? Do you know the people in the university system? And 
turns out I kind of did. So I called a meeting and uh, a whole bunch of great people helped uh, bring First Lego League um, to Oregon in 2001. Um, First Lego League Junior uh, or Junior First Lego League was introduced here in Oregon in 20, uh, 2006. Likewise, uh, First Tech Challenge. Uh, those are for uh, different but slightly overlapping age groups. Um, and First Lego League, Junior First Lego League, it's changed its name a couple of times. It's now called First Lego League Explore. And there's the newest program for the even younger kids, including uh, kindergarten kids. Um, so a lot of uh, programs to choose from. Usually uh, it's going to be based on the age of the kids, but you can see from this list that uh, at certain ages, the kids have a choice of programs. Um, when in doubt, I'd probably start with the younger program and then proceed uh, in the next year into the next program up, but uh, it's all in the details. Um, the programs try to enforce, we don't want um, um, high school sophomores on first Lego League challenge teams, uh, but if the guideline says you should be nine and there happens to be an eight-year-old on the team, no, nobody cares, um, except maybe the coach. Maybe, maybe that eight-year-old is easier than the other kids to uh, get them to collaborate, or maybe they're harder, but it's up to the coach to decide about letting uh, younger kids into a team. But um, we don't want the kids that are older than the age range because that would be an unfair advantage. Questions about uh, all the, the details and overlapping ideas on this slide? So uh, the age range maps uh, to approximately fourth grade to eighth grade. Um, Kids can uh, often get started as fourth graders. And since the challenge is different every year, they'll find it challenging um, because of the new challenge and because there's always more to learn. Um, the, uh, there can be times when the kids will be quite frustrated in the first year because they think they, uh, they're supposed to do everything in the first year. Uh, that's not what it's about. It's about choosing what you do um, in real engineering. Um, a new product is introduced without all the features people imagine. And maybe more features are added in version two and more polish is added in version three. Um, and uh, so we could use the same challenge for years uh, because there's so much that could be go into that challenge, but to keep it fresh, uh, the, the challenge changes every year with some commonality. You can use the same robot kit for several years, same table uh, if you build a plywood table uh, can be used for several years, but the mat changes every year. And we'll get into a couple of examples of that. Um, to use a kind of a rough analogy, um, in the first year, the kids are unlikely to get, get an award. You, you might have to, uh, to be figuratively uh, speaking, the analogy is you might need to be a team running 60 miles an hour in order to be competitive. Uh, the first year, they might get up to 30 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour in this metaphor. Um, that may not be competitive, but they learned a huge amount and hopefully enjoyed it along the way. Then they go to the tournament and uh, they share what they learned and they learn from the other kids and get ideas about uh, better things to do the following year. And maybe they go from 40 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour in the second year, still maybe not getting an award, but getting more sophisticated, more skills, better as a team, better at collaborating. And maybe in the third year, they get a category award. In the fourth year, they, they might get uh, an overall award. Um, but it's not about what you win, it's about what you learn and uh, having fun along the way. And that's that's a, 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 a tough balance. Uh, there is the competitive ethic here in the same way that kids have fun playing soccer and they also compete in most, most soccer cases, uh, there is a score. But uh, at the end of the day, it's how much fun they had and the skills they developed that count, not whether uh, their team happened to win. Questions or thoughts about that? So what is Oregon Robotics Terminal Outreach Program? 
Well, we're also known recently as First Oregon. That may be easier. Um, it's roughly like a franchise. Uh, we're a nonprofit, so we're, uh, we're not in it to, to uh, make money, but we are, we do to pay some staff. We do need to try to break even every year. Um, and we provide services here in Oregon to bring teams up to speed, to support uh, the coaches, uh, to uh, support the learning process uh, preseason and during the season. And, and then we orchestrate a variety of events to, uh, for sharing and honoring achievement. Um, the um, the uh, uh, originally we call ourselves a program because um, my day job was with the Oregon University System, a collection of uh, seven university campuses in, in Oregon. Um, I worked for the umbrella organization. And so we didn't need a separate organization. And so we called it the Oregon Robotics Tournament and Outreach Program, mentioning that we do hold tournaments and we believe in outreach in terms of reaching kids that wouldn't otherwise participate. Um, I didn't know much about it in that uh, first year. So I, I called some people running a tournament in, at Legoland in San Diego and I contacted uh, some people in Minnesota that have been doing it for a couple of years. I think First Lego League was three years old at, in 2001. Um, I like the model in uh, Minnesota a lot better than um, in San Diego. I'm sure the San Diego program has evolved over the years, but at the time it was about hosting an event in at Legoland, which is great. But uh, my guess is the kids that came were upper middle class white boys. And we want all those upper middle class white boys, but we want the girls, we want the minorities, we want the economically disadvantaged kids as well. So to remind ourselves that that's an important aspect of this program, we included the word outreach in the name. Um, the university system uh, restructured in 2014, 2015. It happened to be by coincidence the year I retired. So one of the last things I did as part of my day job was I arranged a spinoff the robotics program um, into a nonprofit. And we've been operating as a nonprofit with a nonprofit board since um, 2014. And I've been on the board. I, I was chair, uh, the first chair, and um, uh, Walt Mayberry chaired uh, the board for several years. And now I'm co chair along with Annalais uh, Guterres of uh, the uh, Central Cultural Program uh, here in Oregon. Uh, questions about who our top is and why we call ourselves and what we do. Sally, uh, Laura mentions that uh, she likes the uh, cooperation competition aspects um, and uh, learning, uh, working together cooperatively and learning those skills. Um, and Sally mentions that her first two recruits are girls, which is certainly great. Uh, there are quite successful teams that are all girls. Um, sometimes that's the right way to go. And uh, when they get a little older, maybe then you want to uh, mix it up with boys because the girls are going to have to learn the skills uh, to deal with those obnoxious boys over time. So uh, uh, kind of it's a judgment call as to when you uh, do it co-ed and when, when you do it uh, gender only. But uh, certainly we, we want to reach a wide variety of kids. Um, the, um, one way to think about it so much seriously, so much sarcastically is the white upper middle class boys will probably do fine without this program. Um, this program can make a big difference in the lives of kids that don't exactly fit that description. Let's see, you gotta click in the right place here. Oh no, my screen is frozen. Oh, oh, now I'm going too fast. Okay, so I mentioned that's got ahead of myself a little bit in terms of our goals. We've had a variety of partners over the years. Um, this summer, we uh, got a, a nice uh, grant from the Oregon Community Foundation to partner up with a, a bunch of uh, nonprofit organizations, which are not listed on this slide, but uh, except for Boys and Girls Club, we partnered with two Boys and Girls Clubs uh, this summer. 
along with uh, other organizations like Centro. Um, the, uh, if a team registers nationally and then registers with us, uh, they can participate in an event. Uh, we have qualifying tournaments uh, for First Lego League Challenge and uh, teams that do well at the uh, qualifying tournament, a percentage of them are invited to attend uh, the state championship. Uh, every year we get calls from coaches a week, two or three weeks before an event saying we're not ready. I guess we better not come. And uh, my answer is, oh, yes, um, unless all the kids are sick that day, you really do need to come because they're going to come back with stories and and um, inspirations uh, that will help them in the, in the next season. And they'll find that they did better than they expected. Um, kids and you as a coach may feel kind of humbled by all the things there are to be done, but uh, <coughs> that event is a great way of sharing and learning. And I've had plenty of uh, coaches over the years pull me aside and say, I'm sure glad you uh, twisted my arm to attend. So uh, Lego has been doing this long enough so that there, I think we're on our um, fourth generation of kit now. Um, EV3 has the, the number three in it, indicating third generation. Uh, Spike Prime, uh, they dropped the number, but it is their fourth generation kit. First, it wasn't obvious as to whether they were going to continue with the EV3, but uh, after six to 12 months of Spike Prime uh, being out there, they announced they were discontinuing EV3, although it remains quite legal for First Lego League Challenge for those who have access to those kits, as uh, are the older kits. Uh, I mentioned the, gener the second generation was referred to as NXT for um, an mis intentional misspelling of NXT. Oh, next. Uh, where can I find the schedule for our top qualifying competitions? Um, I'll send that to you by email. The qualifying tournaments will be in the first couple weekends of December, and that will come pretty fast, especially given uh, some of the challenges we're all facing with COVID. Bruce, I just wanted to clarify on that. So I'm looking at the uh, Frontier STEM calendar, and it says that uh, LeGrand, so if I'm from an Eastern Oregon school, would we just attend that LeGrand tournament? Um. So you, I can actually... you typically have choices. Um, there may only be uh, one or, uh, within easy driving distance and another one at long driving distance, but um, you may end up uh, wanting to go crazy and, and put one of the partner ones as your first choice if you have a way of getting there. Um, but you would typically attend only one uh, of the ones we offer in December. Okay. Uh, so yeah, there's so a Kendra, slight chance that we'll be forced to go all remote again and, uh, this year, like we did last year. But we're hoping that things calm down with COVID and the school districts are okay with uh, the kids traveling to an event. Um, but we're, we have to stay nimble until uh, we finally get this nasty pandemic behind us. So Bruce, yes, I can actually answer that. Uh, Kendra, the Frontier STEM Hub is working on putting together a local tournament here on the Eastern side. And so that will be in Ontario. Oh, okay, and then, sweet. Yeah, and then we would actually uh, go to compete on the Idaho tournament because we can't really pass over those passes in the winter. So we usually go to Twin Falls for state if your teams make it to that. Perfect, thank you so much, I appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, and uh, Melody just accidentally uh, demonstrated competition, right? Teams helping teams. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I can do a little show and tell here. Um, you may, this is a chance where you might wanna put it in speaker view to see this robot a little bigger, depending on the mode you have right now. This is a Spike Prime robot. All of them have this hub. Um, they typically, uh, one for First Lego League, will, will have a pair of motors driving wheels, usually at least one other motor driving a mechanism for grabbing, pushing, et cetera. 
Uh, this one has three. I, uh, there's a, a variety of designs, uh, including ones the kids make up from scratch. Uh, uh, there's another standard design that the robot is bigger with a total of four motors. Um, this one has two color sensors mounted to it. Um, there are other sensors that can be mounted in a variety of ways uh, that come with the kit. And uh, the, the hub actually includes a sensor inside of it. Uh, it's a gyro uh, a sensor that helps the uh, robot navigate on the playing field by uh, measuring the angle of turns. And, uh, if you uh, take next week's workshop, you'll learn about uh, sensors, et cetera. And we'll, we'll touch a little bit on them tomorrow and the next day. But uh, to really get into how, how the sensors work and how to program, we'll take some more time. And we'll do that next week. And there are other ways of doing it if you can't attend the workshop. Um, this is an EV3 robot. Uh, the hub or brain is a slightly bigger with a, a different kind of display. Um, and uh, you cable in sensors on one end and motors on the other end um, for a, a total of uh, potentially four motors and four sensors. Uh, on this one, it's a total of six. Uh, but it's mix and match. You can have two motors and four sensors or four, four motors and two sensors. And the gyro sensor doesn't count against the six because it's built in. Uh, so both of them are quite capable um, and both of them have ways of mounting sensors on them um, to make them navigate better uh, and uh, score more points. Uh, and I'm happy to hold up either robot again and answer any questions about the robots for anybody that has them. So every year there's a playing field. The one on the screen right now is uh, from two years ago called City Shaper. Um, I'll show you this year's mat in a moment. Um, and uh, the, the table that's recommended is uh, four foot by eight foot plywood with two by four rails. Uh, for practices, that's not absolutely required. Uh, teams can be successful in laying the mat on, on a classroom floor or a, uh, a kitchen floor or a garage floor. Um, in a couple of cases, they may need to go find a two by four to simulate the sides. Um, but at the competitions, there's the standard playing fields of, uh, with the ply, uh, plywood base and the two by four sides. Um, and the uh, sides are painted black to make uh, a standard color relative to using sensors. The, uh, the mat typically has some black lines on it that are useful for navigation. Some other things on the mat can also be used as clues to navigation in terms of Detecting a color, a color sensor can tell the difference between blue, red, black, yellow, et cetera. Um, there are other ways of navigating with the gyro, with, the, uh, with a range sensor that uses ultrasound, um, with a force uh, or touch sensor that can uh, detect when the robot is touched or, or run into something. Um, a, a new team is uh, uh, Encouraged to use at least one sensor to get more reliable results, uh, but uh, probably not to go crazy with too many sensors until they get used to how the sensors are programmed. Um, a, a new team can also do, uh, get score points by dead reckoning without any sensors at all. Uh, although if you get that to work um, uh, after a few weeks, I recommend experimenting with sensors because it'll make uh, the kids happier if they can score points three out of four times rather than one, one every uh, uh, five times or whatever. Uh, sensors make, make for a much more reliable, predictable robot. Um, here's that same mat in three dimensions. You can see that the robot starts in one of the corners um, and runs out to uh, particular mission elements to accomplish missions. Um, the robot is free to come back to that corner after each mission. The kids can swap out parts if they want to, uh, kind of analogous to NASCAR uh, coming back into the pit to change tires. Um, it's more likely that they would change a mechanism than change the tires 
in, in robotics, but uh, it would be legal to change tires if they want to. They can also uh, uh, touch the top of the robot to select a different program for their next mission. Um, if they find it necessary uh, to grab the robot when it's outside of that uh, home base area, they'll lose some bonus points. So they're encouraged to program the robot to not only go to the mission, but also get itself back so they can select the next mission. Um, but if they have to re, uh, retrieve the robot by hand, uh, that uh, the, they're not disqualified, they just lose some bonus points. Um, a more sophisticated team may figure out how to navigate to one uh, mission location, uh, score some points there, and then navigate to a second one, score some points, and then maybe navigate to a third one before it has to go to home base to uh, get repositioned or get a new mechanism for other missions. Um, in the city shaper um, season, um, you could do the missions in any order, but um, the points that you got from that ramp that you can see on the right-hand side of this slide um, were where the robot ended up at the end of two and a half minutes. So typically the kids would select that as their last mission because if they selected as their second mission then and left the ramp, they wouldn't be able to get those points. That was also a shared mission. Uh, and we'll, we'll get into more share, uh, about sharing in a minute. Can anybody tell that I not only have a parrot in another room, I have a dog that wants out of this room. Household is zoo, two cats, two dogs, and a parrot. Um, This is this year. Uh, I know less about this because I haven't studied up, uh, but you can see some similarities. Uh, the home base in the lower left-hand corner, an area to the left where the kids uh, have, can hold spare parts, et cetera. You know, the black lines uh, in various places that help for navigation and mission elements uh, all over the place. Way too many missions. To, uh, to program in one season. And if they manage to uh, get them all done somehow in a, in a fall season, they probably couldn't get them all done in the two and a half minutes that they'll have in each tournament round. So um, part of the engineering, uh, the teamwork is to figure out what missions they're actually gonna do in what order and which team members are going to be at the table, the, the rule is only two team members at the table at once, but they can tag uh, in and out, not literally, they don't have to touch each other, but they, uh, the kids at the board can, can back away and two other kids can come up anytime in the two and a half minutes. Got one more picture to show you and then I need to take some questions and I can go back to any of these pictures. Here's two, uh, tables back to back. And this is how it's run at official tournaments. Um, partly for dramatic effect, uh, the robots uh, never touch each other. It's not like they're uh, playing uh, a uh, contact sport. Um, that's uh, for, for the uh, middle, for first tech challenge and first robotic competition, the robots can touch each other, but not with in first Lego league, they're on separate tables but the tables are back to back at most tournaments. Um, and there's almost always a shared mission in the middle uh, on the, the double rail between the two tables. Sometimes that's a cooperative mission that they get extra points if they cooperate over that mission. And sometimes it's a competitive mission, the first one to get to the top, um, kind of is the king of the hill for those extra points for the mission that's uh, on that double rail in the middle. Um, if, it's, if you're having trouble sorting out uh, the playing field, kind of look in the foreground, you see something in blue and white. And if you look in the distant background, you'll see that that same thing is on the other table in the opposite corner. The, uh, the start position in the foreground um, is, and the foreground table is in, uh, on the left. Excuse me, I'm cockpit errors. Um, it's just off screen. 
and the start location for the uh, more distant tables uh, in the, on the right, you can kind of see that depending on how your screen is laid out. So questions about these tables, these maps, the uh, mission elements, let's see, I'll, pr I'll prime the pump by answering a common question. Um, the kids create the robot, program the robot, the, Adults should keep their hands off the robot. Uh, on the flip side, the adults uh, are welcome to help build the mission elements uh, that go on the table. Uh, it's okay to have the kids do all that building as long as uh, you kind of observe that they're doing it correctly. Um, the a rough analogy is uh, almost always uh, the kids that are playing basketball in fourth, fifth, sixth grade are not the ones that built the basketball court or put up the hoop. Um, so the adults can do that to make it standard uh, or they can get the kids to help them. Or if the kids are skilled at Legos, maybe the kids can do the whole thing. Um, so uh, it's, we're very flexible in terms of the spirit of setting up these tables, uh, but we're not flexible uh, when it comes to uh, designing, building and programming the robot, the kids should do that work. Um, the coach can uh, uh, help them build skills by teaching them what a gear ratio is or what a sensor is, but the kids should actually do the, uh, the building and the programming. Uh, when in doubt, don't tell them what to do. Ask them a question that causes them to think about what they might do and, and make the decision. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One is fairness. Uh, we want uh, the kids to be the engineers in all cases to make it fair at the competition. Uh, but perhaps a more important one is the depth of learning is huge when the kids make their own mistakes and, uh, and get past those mistakes and learn what works and what doesn't work. The, uh, the learning is very shallow when they just do what the coach tells them to do and that's illegal anyway. Uh, so anyway, I was answering a question I posed to myself. What I, have a, I have a question, Bruce. What about mentors uh, for the teams? Are they allowed like high school mentors? Um, yes, the uh, the mentors, even if they're under 18 or uh, in the way I just described are, are still considered adults when it comes to uh, uh, keeping their hands off the robot. Uh, they can ask the questions, they can they can uh, explain what a sensor does and how it works. They can uh, they can talk about gears, um, uh, the right the various things that they might know from past experience. Um, but they're they're not the ones that design, build, or program the robot, uh, because the kids in the age range for the program uh, are the ones that do that. Um, follow up questions, Hunter. Oh shit! No, that's good. Thanks. Hey, Bruce, I had a question. I think this might be a really dumb question, but I'm brand new to this. So do we get the mats to practice on when the kids, like when the kids are learning, do we get those mats or are these nat mats brand new? Oh, yeah, that, the that, that, that's, that's a great question. I, and I should have anticipated it. So keep those questions coming. Um, in the whole universe, there are uh, uh, things where you go to an event and you're told what the challenge is at the event. But, uh, but that's the um, exact opposite for all of the uh, first programs. You, you get everything you need to uh, do the, this stuff during the team meetings. Um, and the event is a culminating event for, to demonstrate what you learn. The kids will often make last minute changes at the event, but they're encouraged to uh, try to freeze their design and, and freeze uh, their programming before the event, uh, rather than take the risk of, of uh, making a change that doesn't work at the event. To answer your specific question, um, when you register a team, you pay a national fee to register that gets you, uh, makes you legal in the program uh, and uh, gets you an engineering notebook and some other materials, access to things online and makes you legal for registering with, at the state level to, uh, to attend a qualifying. And you have an opportunity to, to spend another $75 to get the mat and all the Lego kits that you see 
uh, Lego parts that you see on the mat. Uh, and then you uh, get access to downloadable instructions to build all those things that are on the mat. So uh, that's one of the first things you do each season. If next year you get started in June or July, you can practice on the last year's mat or make up your own mat, or we have a downloadable mini mat that you, uh, you can print locally. But uh, once they announce uh, how to build these elements, which they always do in the second or third week of August, you're encouraged to go ahead and build all those things and lay out the mat somewhere. And uh, the way to keep these Lego things stuck to the mat is to use a 3M uh, equivalent to Velcro. Uh, uh, 3M ca calls it dual lock because um, the A and the B side are the same. Uh, you don't have the fuzzy stuff and the, and the hooky stuff. Both sides have hooks and you put one side on the mat and the other side um, on the Lego thing and you stick it down to the mat so it doesn't move when the robot bumps up against it. And you'll become quite expert on how to do that when you've had a little practice. And uh, that's been going on for years that we use dual lock. Um, and the robot doesn't use dual lock. The, uh, the mission elements on the mat use dual lock. Uh, Kendra, does that answer uh, most of your question, follow up? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So um, Kendra and Carrie, and if I have any other Mal here teachers on here other than you guys, uh, talk to me at the Frontier STEM Hub. You guys have my email and we will help you with purchasing and registering and all of that. And we'll help you get those kits. So any questions, anything like that, you can ask me anytime and we'll also help with that funding piece. Um, here's a question I haven't got yet, but uh, somebody should be asking, so I will. Um, how do you get the robot kit? Uh, you have two ways of getting it. Uh, the standard way is when you register the, a new team, um, you order the first Lego League Challenge uh, kit, which is actually two Lego kits. The base kit that comes in a tub. Let's see if I can grab a tub. This is the uh, EB3 tub, it's black. The Spike Prime tub is, is yellow. Um, and there are sorting trays inside. If I take it, you know, there's lots of Legos in there. Um, but a competitive team for First Lego League Challenge needs another box of parts that come in a cardboard box and you can sort them into these uh, trays. Um, if you order the standard First Lego League Challenge kit, you get both and you save five or $10 over going to Lego Education and buying them separately. If for some reason, um, you need more kits and you uh, have trouble getting them through the team registration process, you can go to legoeducation.com and um, you can order more tubs of uh, parts um, and uh, more uh, auxiliary kits. I've, anybody remember what the name of the add-on kit is? It's not add-on, it's not auxiliary. Expansion, I think it's expansion kit. It might be essentials. Oh, Essentials is, is the new kit for, um, for First Lego League Explore. They just announced that. Um, and I haven't seen how it's packaged yet. I did uh, place an order a few days ago and they're apparently gonna start shipping that in uh, September. Um, a, for the last uh, five years or so, the Explore program has used a kit called We Do and it's on version 2.0 but they're phasing that out. And uh, the, uh, the new kit for Explorer is called Spike Essentials. Uh, it, at a glance, it looks like it uses the same hub, but if you look a little closer, it's actually a bit smaller. Um, and uh, the uh, parts you use are, are simpler parts than come in the Spike Prime kit. But I'll be able to speak more knowledgeably once my, my kit comes. Um, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll have a workshop for First Lego League Explorer at some point. We don't have one right now. Other questions? 
Uh, yeah, I had a quick question. This is Chris. It, it'll be faster to just ask it. Um, Please. From what I understand, uh, the programming for Spike Prime can be either Scratch or it can be in Python. Is it? Uh, yes. Can you sure. mix? Can you mix and match the programs between the two, or do you have to commit to one or the other when setting up programs? Um, I'm going to guess that you can mix and match. Uh, you store them in the uh, Spike Prime hub has 20 storage locations, and you can put one program in each. So I'm going to guess that you could uh, you could put some uh, word blocks programs in some of those slots and Python programs in others. But uh, I haven't personally done that. So there's a slight chance I'm wrong about that. So I'll, I'll try to research that and give you a more confident answer tomorrow or the next day. Great, thank you. Um, but that leads to a, another question. We might as well touch on now, we can expand on later. Um, the software for programming is free. Uh, you could download it before you get your kit and you can play with it a little bit, but you're going to quickly learn that it's not much fun unless you can download it to a robot. That, uh, so there's no risk uh, to Lego for making it downloadable on the web because to really use it, you need a robot kit. Um, but um, you, you download it, you install it on a PC, a Mac, a, a, a variety of different uh, uh, Apple and Android type pads. Um, it's not a hundred, not every possible thing uh, under the sun, but uh, relatively recent technology, you can probably download the software to it. Um, my experience is with uh, uh, um, the current version of Windows, uh, although I think it uh, support, might support an older version. Um, I've also done it on uh, the current version of the Mac OS. And I've done it on a relatively recent version of uh, um, oh, what's what are the Android uh, pads? Uh, drawing a blank here. Chromebooks. I've got a, a nice Chromebook that I, I've programmed these robots on. So, so it's, that's three examples of the platforms you could choose for Spike Prime, and uh, most of them are supported uh, by the new version of the EB3 software, which I should mention. Um, and I'll expand on this as we get into it um, on tomorrow and the next day. The uh, EV3 standard language until a year ago uh, was called uh, EV3 Lab or EV3G. It's two different names for the same thing. It's a technology based on some things done at Tufts University called LabVIEW. Tufts based their technology on a, um, no, excuse me, Tufts calls theirs RoboLab, and they base theirs on LabVIEW from uh, National Instruments, a, an instrument company that designed a very clever language for controlling intelligent instruments. Um, very uh, interesting language, but very, very unconventional and relatively hard for the kids to learn. Um, so um, after uh, a lot of kids invest and a lot of coaches invest in learning uh, EV3G and EV, EV3Lab, which are the same thing. Um, Lego eventually gave up about a year ago and said, we're going all scratch. If you are, already have the software downloaded, um, you can still use EV3G. It's still perfectly legal. Uh, you can choose your language for um, anything that works. But uh, if you go to download for the EV3 today, it's going to download what they call EV3 Classroom, which is a version of Scratch. Um, if you uh, download for Spike Prime, you'll get a big app that has um, a version of Scratch called uh, WordBlocks and a version of Python and um, has a lot of lessons for learning. Um, so uh, the two platforms for EV3 uh, software platforms that are current are both Scratch based. They're not 95% the same. The main differences are Different sensors require different blocks. Um, they can't be identical because the robots aren't identical, but the programming principles are all the same between EV3 Classroom 
in spike prime word blocks, but they're quite different from the historic thing that I keep calling EV3G and EV3Lab, uh, which uh, I can get into, but um, if you want to use those old, older languages, I'm happy to consult with you offline, but we won't be going into those uh, this week or next <coughs> because they're so different. <coughs> Questions about, about that? All right, anything we've covered so far? Let me check uh, chat here. Oh, extension kit instead of expansion kit. Okay, thank you, uh, Rajid. So let's talk some concepts. Uh, the diagram I'm about to show you does not exist on anywhere but my brain and my slide, but I think you'll find it somewhat useful. The robot always has to have a microprocessor. It lives inside a big Lego block. The Spike Prime calls it a hub. I forget what EV3 calls it, but it's essentially a hub. Uh, there's a microprocessor inside there. I've never seen one taken apart. I'm just assuming there is because that's the way it behaves. Uh, you can use, uh, you can take Lego motors and connect them to that hub. Um, in EV3, you take the motors out of, a, out of your tub and you take some connecting cables and plug them into the motors and plug them into the hub. Spike Prime, every motor already has a cable, so you only have to plug it in to the hub. <clears throat> but to, uh, to give those motors power, it has to be plugged in the hub because the hub's got the battery. Uh, but more importantly, to tell them to go, the microprocessor that lives in the hub needs to tell them to go. And the reason that that microprocessor will do so is because the kids wrote a program that says, turn on the motors or move a certain number of inches. Um, I, I'm alluding here to a two motors driving wheels, but those motors can do other things besides wheels. Then quite separately from the hub is the computer that does not come with the kit. And uh, you hopefully already have one or you have a budget to buy one. It can be a laptop, a Chromebook, or a variety of different pads. That's where you run the software that you download from the LEGO Education website. Uh, the app includes building instructions, learning lessons, and programming tools. So you run those on your laptop or Chromebook or pad. And then you have two ways of getting them into the robot hub. One is to use a USB cable, uh, which is um, similar to the cable that you would run from the uh, laptop to a cell phone. Or, uh, both of the hubs that we're talking about, the EB3 and Spike Prime, also have a way of doing this with Bluetooth. Um, and I encourage you to use Bluetooth whenever possible. If you happen to have a dozen uh, laptops and a dozen robots all in the same room, there's a chance that your room will fill full of Bluetooth signals and get confused, and you'll have to go use the cables. And the cables are always there in case you have trouble with Bluetooth. The advantage of using it wirelessly is the, uh, the robot can be sitting on the mat, the kids can go back to the laptop, change the program, download the program to the robot and tell it to go without having to lift that robot and plug it back into the computer. But they have always got the cable as that option. They can always lift it off the mat, plug the cable into it and download uh, from there. There's EV3 has a separate charging cable the Spike Prime uses the same USB cable to, to charge the battery on the robot as it does to program um, the robot. Uh, and then the, at the risk of making your head explode, the hubs come with software that is not programmed by the kids, that is the software that knows how to interpret the kids' programs. And for technical historical reasons that's called firmware because you don't change it very often it's the very changeable stuff is the stuff the kids do and that's called software the stuff that lego changes once a month and lately it seems like once a week is called firmware and if you if you're busily using um, 
plugging in your uh, your EV3, your excuse me, your Spike Prime hub, um, powering it on, connecting uh, either the cable or, or the Bluetooth, up pops the screen that says your hub needs firmware update. Click here to update your firmware. And depending on the speed of your internet connection, uh, it'll take you somewhere between a minute and five minutes to update the firmware. So you've got the latest and greatest from Lego living inside the big brick, the hub. Then you can add to the hub sensors that uh, are the eyes, ears, and maybe the nose of the robot. Um, and depending on which uh, hub you're using, you can have uh, one, two, three, or four sensors. In the case of Spike Prime, there's also a sensor built in called a gyro sensor. And uh, the uh, metaphor of, of this being the eyes and ears is fairly appropriate. Um, it is possible to, uh, for kids to, to do play acting where uh, uh, kid A tells kid B, walk two steps forward, turn left, walk two steps forward, uh, and now kneel down and, and pick up the robot. Uh, if the kids do that with their, uh, their eyes closed or with the blindfold, uh, they're going to have trouble finding that robot. Uh, but they might be able to if the instructions are precise enough and the, the number of steps they take are the same time every time. But if, by opening their eyes uh, and using their sensors in this metaphor, they can more, much more reliably get the job done. And that's what the sensors are for in the robot. So this is uh, Bruce's diagram of how Lego robots work, how they're programmed, and wh what lives where to get it all done. Uh, for a few of you, uh, this is old news. For a few of you, this is an aha moment. And for a few of you, I'm totally confused the point by uh, showing you uh, turquoise squares on a screen rather than showing you real hubs and real cables. I, I'll show you a real cable. Um, here's a real Spike Prime programming and charging cable on one end. So I give it a little yank. Um, other end, you can see this is the connector that can plug in to a little charging brick or to a laptop. Questions about this diagram, what I'm trying to cover here? How are we doing on time? Oh, it's already 8.05. Uh, Hunter had to go. So here's a summary of the kits. We'll, we'll touch on this next time. Um, and I'll, I'll send you the PDF so you can peruse this. The uh, and the number of, we'll talk about this a little bit more next time. We can see three to 10 kids on a team. Um, we'll talk about core values um, and the Lego experience, a little bit about how to deal with COVID. And then we'll get into new material uh, uh, that's in the second hour of material. So we're a little behind schedule, but we'll catch up. Um, and in the third hour, we'll get more into programming and that'll be Wednesday evening. Uh, sorry, we ran over. Uh, any questions? Uh, anybody that needs to go, certainly welcome to go. Hope to see you again, 7 p.m. tomorrow. The link uh, that you got from registering should work again tomorrow. Um, please let me know if that's not true. I'm 99% uh, true that same link for tomorrow should work. Questions from anybody? Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate this. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, keep those questions coming, including sending me email between now and tomorrow. Look forward to seeing uh, hopefully all of you tomorrow and have a good rest of your evening. Let's see if I stop share. Some of us will get bigger and then I can wave and say, I'm going to click the end button. Bye bye.